This is going to be a big session, and just to remind you, we do have media with us, which is brilliant. Welcome. Um, as you see, we have a fantastic panel assembled, and Charlie is e-chairing this time in the way that I did. That means she's the boss of the Slido. Um, as, a num <laughs> as a number of you have learned, once she approves a question, you can vote it up or down if you so wish. And if you feel that Slido is in some way anti-democratic or a backward step, you can take yourself and stand militantly or happily behind one of those two microphones. But if you want to do that, I ask that you save that until after all of our panelists have had their turn. So we're running it like um, a military operation or probably for me, an assembly. I've got a time frame, I've got some people to get through and by goodness, we're going to do it. The speakers, I'm not even going to properly introduce them because I think they're all incredibly well known to you, but what we have tried to do is get some breadth and depth of knowledge and expertise and views from across the sector. Um, you all have copies of their bios and I just want to start now by thanking all of you for taking the time to be part of this. I think it's going to be a fantastic discussion and it's going to really open up our whole of conference conversation. So. In the order listed in the program, each speaker is going to get up to 10 minutes all to themselves. And then at the end of that, we're going to have 35 to 40 minutes, depending on how efficient we've been, to have a really good discussion. OK? So Anna, if you would like to start, please. Your and you pointed at the back of the room, I OK. All right. All right. Uh, Kira Koto. Um, I'm Anna Clark. I'm Deputy Director General Health Workforce at the Ministry. So uh, firstly I'd like to thank Sarah Murray and the ASMS Executive for the opportunity to come along today to do my strictly 10 minute presentation and pay, take part in the um, discussion. And I'd also like to thank you all. Um, this has been a really challenging year uh, for the health sector and for the country and for the world. Um, so thank you for the work that you have done and um, helping keep our country safe um, and during this, this really challenging time. So um, on behalf of the Ministry of Health, a big thanks. Um, I've no doubt we're going to have a, a robust conversation um, as we move into the panel and, and I thought how I would frame up my presentation is just to provide some information, some facts and some data that could perhaps help inform, inform the discussion as it, as it carries on. So one of the first things I want to talk about is the impact that employment in the health and disability system has on New Zealand as a whole. Um, you've met and heard from Joe Baxter earlier, and we are incredibly fortunate in the ministry to have Joe sit on our Health Workforce Advisory Board. Um, and that board is chaired by Judy McGregor, who's also the chair of Waitamata DHB. And when Judy took up the role, one of the first things she said is, What's the impact that the health workforce has on the social and economic um, climate in New Zealand? And we couldn't find any information. So my directorate has done a piece of work, research. We've had it peer reviewed and it's gonna go up on our website very shortly. And I just wanted to share some, some key data for you. So there's almost 250,000 people employed in the health and disability system as at December last year. Um, and the healthcare and social assistance sector is the country's largest employer, so it employs 11% of the country's workforce. In five regions, it's the largest employer, and it's the second largest in Canterbury and the third largest in Auckland and Wellington. And health institutions are often referred to as anchor institutions. So this means that in good economic times and bad economic times, um, they provide a really stable base for employment um, and they, they can help anchor the economy. And that's certainly what we're seeing now um, through COVID-19. So along with the large numbers of employment, um, also come some large numbers in terms of salary. So, for the year ended 31 December 2019 again, um, DHB spent about $6.2 billion um, on the employment of staff that they employed directly, and there's about another $7 billion that, that um, flows through to the salary, to the funded sector in terms of salaries and wages. So the total cost of the health and disability sector workforce is estimated to be around 66% of vote health 
and 15% of core Crown expenses. So it's a significant investment um, that, the, that the country makes in our health workforce. I thought I'd do a, a wee breakdown um, across the various occupations in DHBs. I'm not picking on DHBs, it's just much easier for us to get data from them than from um, other parts of the sector. So as you can see, within DHBs, the, the medical workforce makes up about 25% of its salary bill. And as you've heard from Joe, um, equity is incredibly important. We need to grow a workforce that reflects the communities that the health workforce serves. So Māori and Pacific populations are not well represented in the health and disability workforce within DHBs. And again, that will extrapolate out across the funded sector, but the data we have is, is from the district health boards. So while Māori are about 15% of our population, um, only, they only make up 8% of the DHB employed workforce. And Pacific peoples are about 8% of the population, but make up 4% of that workforce. And as you can see from the, from the slide, um, you know, the significant number of Māori and Pacific um, are in personal care and assistant roles. And the numbers get less as we move up through clinical roles, with medical being uh, the least, which is why the work that Jo and her team are doing at Otago and that Auckland University is doing through MAPIS is so incredibly important. So I have no doubt whatsoever that we will have a conversation uh, as part of the panel discussion about the need uh, for more, um, more people in our health workforce and more SMOs. What I did think I would do is just show you a slide that looks at the changes in FTEs employed across DHBs in the last five years. So there's been a, an increase of around 10,000 FTEs in the last five years. What that slide doesn't show you is where those FTEs have gone. Um, so my team have done some research for me and they have said that in the last 10 years there's 1,700 more SMOs in the system now than there were 10 years ago. So health workforce funding. Um, you may or may not be aware that the Ministry of Health looks after um, health workforce funding that goes towards the training and education, uh, post-grad training and education of, of health professionals. So this funding supports new graduate nurses, midwives, pharmacists and doctors. So we, we um, pay money to the DHBs to train PGY1s and PGY2s. Um, we subsidise the cost of vo vocational training for, for doctors. Um, and it also supports postgraduate training for some other professions, including nurses, so nurse practitioner program is a really good example of that. Um, and a smaller amount of money goes to support our Kaiafina workforce and um, specifically targeted, targeted at Māori and Pacific workforces. So we recently did a current state assessment of our funding and where the money goes and how we spend it. Um, if you'd like to know more about that, the report uh, which was done for us by Martin Jenkins is available on the Ministry of Health website. You just need to click on the Health Workforce tab and it will, it will take you there. Um, and this shows you the breakdown. So um, obviously medical is the highest and, and that's not surprising at all considering the length of time um, and the cost involving, involved in, in training specialists through their PGY1, through their vocational education. Um, in this last slide, uh, what I have set out is a wee bit about the Ministry of Health Health Workforce Directorate. So we've been in place for about 18 months now. Um, and the, the things in the system are a, a wee bit in flux. Obviously, there's a health and disability system review, and part of that re review includes looking at the role of the ministry as well. But what my team's kind of current purpose and guiding statement for the work we do is ensuring that we have the right people with the right skills in the right place at the right time now and also on into the future. So when we think about our work, I ask the team to think about a number of longer term outcomes or objectives we want to achieve. And that means a whole of system, whole of workforce approach. So thinking about our workforce across DHBs, NGOs and the funded sector. Um, and thinking about the whole workforce um, from your, our kaiafina through to, through to our um, SMOs and thinking about the workforce pipeline in its entirety. It's about achieving equitable outcomes and building a health workforce um, that, uh, 
that will help to deliver equitable health outcomes for all of all New Zealanders. Um, really relevant today, it's about centralised and data-led workforce planning across the pipeline. It's about system level leadership as well because the, the workforce pipeline and how we invest and train go some way to addressing workforce issues, but the leadership goes in the, um, is really important to address some of the other issues that I hear raised really frequently around fatigue and burnout and cultures within the workplace. Uh, flexible and enabling education and regulatory systems. It's the right mix of generalists and specialists. We want what we do to be future-proofed and innovative, and we want to balance national and regional uh, needs. So a few pieces of work that we have underway around this. Um, one of them is, I'm just looking at Sarah for a time check. Um, one of them, a minute, a minute. One of them is a data project. So we get really good data on um, the clinical and regulated workforces through the responsible authorities. What we don't have is data on our kaiafina um, and non-regulated workforces. And it's a lot harder to get because they're, they're largely employed out in the funded sector. So we're doing a big piece of work at the moment around how we can collect that data and we're about to launch a pilot um, around collecting that data to enable us to have data on the whole of the health workforce so we can really start to do some evidence led workforce planning. We're doing some work around leadership and leadership programs and what common leadership capabilities and competencies would look like across the system. So this work's unique in that it's, it's not focused solely on um, DHBs or a particular workforce or profession, it's focused on leadership at all levels across the health sector and across the entire health sector. Um, and we also started to do a review of our funding. So that current state assessment I talked about earlier was the first stage. Um, the next stage from there was to begin to look at how we built a, um, a funding model that was really responsive to data and evidence that, was, that responded to current immediate needs, but also look to the future around what our population would need. Um, we've paused that because we've sort of run up against the health and disability system review, and commissioning and funding um, is a big part of what the review is considering. Bang on time, so thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And the next person up is I don't know. I don't know who's next Peter on the Crampton. program. It's Peter Crampton. <laughs> Kia ora, Sarah. <laughs> Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Peter Crampton tōku ingoa. Nō te pōti ahau. Uh, Kei te whare mananga o watakau ahau e mahi ana. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I'm starting my timer right now. Uh, <laughs> it is a real pleasure to be here with you. I, I would like to acknowledge the conference organisers uh, for the gathering uh, and uh, Jo Baxter for her keynote address. Uh, I was uh, online earlier today at a virtual conference, so I missed out on Jo's address but I believe she may have deconstructed the pipeline metaphor a little bit uh, and uh, added some complexity perhaps to the picture. And I'm gonna be picking up on some of those comments. I would also like to acknowledge all of you for your work uh, during what has been a truly extraordinary year. The hats I wear for these few brief comments, primarily I'm an academic. Uh, I'm a public health academic with a background originally in general practice. I work in Kohatu, the Centre for Holder Māori at the University of Otago based in Dunedin. Joe is my boss, so I've watched my uh, P's and Q's. Uh, I have had a number of other roles which are relevant. Uh, I've been involved with health workforce production one way or another for a very long time. Uh, as Dean of the University of Otago Wellington, uh, Dean of the Otago Medical School based in Dunedin and Pro Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences. So I bring those perspectives. More recently I've been on the Health and Disability System Review Panel and that has a focus on health workforce as well. Uh, and also on equity and also on the Māori and Pacific elements of our workforce and on uh, Te Tiriti or Waitangi. 
Uh, and also, I've been intimately involved for a long time, for 10 years, in the Mirror on Society policy, and you might have been hearing about that more recently in the media. And I'll come back to the intention of that policy in just a moment. In my view, by a country mile, the greatest asset in our health system are the people who work in it. Structures pale into relative insignificance. I'm not nihilistic about structures, but they are less significant than the people. And the people are bound together by culture, shared values, ways of working, and leadership. Those elements matter so much, irrespective of the uh, structures. We have these wonderful people, and we just heard about how many are employed in the New Zealand health system. They are our greatest asset, yet we face major challenges with racism and with inequitable provision of services and inequitable health outcomes. Fundamentally unacceptable and non-sustainable. The reality is that settler colonial societies structure opportunities in a way that favour some and disadvantage others. And it is our collective task to do our bit to undo that. Now, in terms of the health workforce, the health system receives the health professionals who come out of our polytechs and our universities. The health system doesn't surprisingly have a huge amount of control over what it receives. Sorry for the depersonalizing metaphor here, but those widgets have a particular configuration, be it a physiotherapist, a nurse, or a cardiothoracic surgeon. And the system actually has to adopt its own, adapt its own receptor sites to those widgets. So the system actually conforms to the health workforce produced in tertiary uh, institutions to some greater or lesser extent. And that's the magic in what I'm about to uh, share with you. Because it is that adaptation process to the people who graduate from health professional programs, it is the adaptation process which allows us to change the system from the inside in terms of the attributes, the values, the knowledge, the wisdom, the expertise those people bring with them. And I believe it is our duty to change the system from the inside using the tool of the health workforce. If we wish to have a pro-equity system, a system where there is a reduction in systematic bias, a system which does not consistently produce decade after decade inequitable interventions across different population groups. If we aspire to achieve those objectives, then we can use the tool of the health workforce to help drive change from the inside. The Mirror on Society policy is one such approach where at the University of Otago we've said that we wish to produce graduating cohorts of health professionals who will help populate the workforce, the health workforce, with health professionals who as a group reflect the diverse communities in Aotearoa with a focus on Māori, with a focus on Pacific, with a focus on socioeconomic representation. It is our experience very, very powerfully, and increasingly your experience as you receive increasingly diverse cohorts of graduates, that those people bring change with them. They look different, they sound different, they behave differently. No human being is immune from uh, what is politely called unconscious bias, aka racism in some contexts, no human being is immune from that, but those people bring different sets of expertise, knowledge, and biases, and they enrich all of us, and they improve, most critically, the quality of health outcomes for our patients and our communities. So, uh, take-home messages. When I'm back here in my next life, in 20 or 30 years, uh, this audience will look different 
I can just about guarantee that. This will be a different group of people. And we do need to change. We need to change if we want different outcomes from our mahi, from our work. Aotearoa has an unwritten constitution. Its fundamental component is Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Tangata Tiriti, Pākehā, need to start acting, behaving, believing, and educating themselves in a way that they take their status in relation to Tiriti o Waitangi seriously. That's a lot of us in this room, it's certainly me. Because we can imagine a future where Tangata Tiriti and Tangata Whenua live together happily, mutually enriching uh, different communities, and equitably. We can shed the barbaric, inequitable distribution of the structures of opportunity that are built into our colonial society and are strongly reflected in this room. We can shed those inequitable distributions and we can aspire to be post-colonial. Right now, we're resolutely colonial. We can move beyond that. We can imagine a different future. And that means that what goes into the metaphorical pipeline will look and feel and behave differently. Namihi mahana kia koutou katoa. Kia ora, Peter. I, I'm really interested that we've had a pipeline and garden, and I often think about a swamp. But um, <laughs> so let's see where we can go with this. Deborah, your challenge. <laughs> the swamp. Slide <laughs> on that. Okay. Yes. Got ten minutes. Okay, and I push this button to change slides. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you have to pick it up and point it at those nice men at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she's a lady. No, no, mm. the ones on the left. Oh, okay. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kia ora, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, I'm going to focus my attention on the medical workforce itself, as you would probably expect. Obviously, I have spent 30 years representing resident doctors in this country, and it's good to see so many um, still are members of ASMS, which is all good. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the fact that we're around quite a long time. And sitting here um, on the podium, um, I was just uh, looking at you and uh, thinking, there's one of my consultants who is still here and... Um, all credit to continuing to represent um, SMOs. We are a profession that's around a while and we do have relationships. Um, we also have culture and I think one of the things I'm going to be challenging you on is our culture as I think Peter has already started to do. Just one quick proviso, my talk is entitled New Zealand's Medical Pipeline. Um, that is what I am focusing on. Um, no disrespect intended to those people that join us for a temporary period and disappear. They, you know, we have a lot of good people who come and work here in New Zealand and then move on. Uh, but one of my main points is we need to train and retain our own if we're going to get a medical pipeline that is sustainable for the future needs of our population. So just that one disclaimer. And back to the swamp. Um, <laughs> um, I often um, seem to end up with this. We, um, it, it's pretty difficult out there. I'm, I'm talking to you in the midst of a uh, absolute um, disaster of a changeover. Thank you for changing the start time of the RMO year. It is chaos out there. And I will come back to that in a minute. However, in and amongst that chaos, we still have to keep on going. And let's be honest, if it's, if it's not this crisis, it's going to be another one. So we have to take the energy to rise up and continue to put work into changing our pipeline. Um, and how you do that while there are alligators um, literally snapping at you, um, we'll just have to find a way. Um, I'm a great one for goals and challenges. And I, I suspect this is going to continue to be one for us all. But we're going to have to put some energy into it. So, talking about changeover, um, I've just put this slide up. Because of the challenges that we get in short term as well as long term, this is the latest vacancies from December. These are DHB data. Uh, they're not accurate because, you know, DHBs 
don't tell each other the truth, blessings. So, for instance, in Northland, we're nine uh, medical registrars down out of 20, not seven. And we're also seven house surgeons short in Northland, and um, I am going to focus on Northland a bit, because as far as the medical workforce is concerned in that particular area, we are incredibly fragile, and this is one of the failures of our pipeline. So, you can see a distribution there, and the employers have ringed the areas that they think are, are a problem. Um, apparently... Um, 13 registrars in psychiatry isn't a problem for the Auckland region, but um, uh, that aside, you've got to wonder why six ONG registrars are absent in Southern, just saying. But obviously our medical registrars are the biggest population here who are absent at this point in time. That is largely as a result of the FRACP Part 1 falling only weeks after the changeover. Those registrars are taking Christmas off to study because that exam is too important to them. And as a result, we have a deficit of medical registrars in the country. Um, and I will come back to that again. So what's happening to the RMOs? And we've been talking with them, this, this, them about this. They are quite clear. They are slowing down the pipeline. They know they are. Um, why? You know, why aren't you rushing to be the SMO that you're being trained to be? Now, they know they'll end up as SMOs, because you can't sort of not, but um, they're slowing it down. So why not? Number one. What does the future look like, SMO burnout? They're seeing it. They're watching you. They don't want that. They're slowing down. And to a certain extent, they're making it worse, aren't they? Because if they don't graduate, how are we going to get enough SMOs to deal with a burnout problem? <laughs> but they don't want it. Now, we have a whole cohort of RMOs now. We've just done our stop work meetings around the country ahead of bargaining. And a whole cohort who are what we call Schedule 10, they haven't worked more than 10 days in a row. And they cannot imagine that life. They've never done it. And that group of RMOs will continue to come through the system. And on the other hand, we have SMOs who are still working 12 days in a row, who are working 80-hour weekends, or 56, but the 80-hour if you count the Friday, who are fatigued, exhausted, making mistakes, and I'm going to go there, committing suicide. We have got to deal with this as a profession. We really do. Work-life balance, including part-time employment, and gender inequity. We've heard about racial discrimination. I'm going to talk a bit about gender inequity. Over 50%, uh, and in fact, almost 60% of resident doctors are now female. Uh, training is now used as a threat, not a carrot. Interesting comment came from our vice president. What does he mean? DHBs don't support training. Yes, they do. They spend millions on it. Um, yeah, but we have to fight for every element. It's no longer a good thing to be training to become an SMO. It's a fight, and it's used as a threat against us. We will you know, stop you training. We won't give you access to, so you won't qualify. It's having an impact on the RMOs, and we need to resist that. Um, what it's not about is hours of work. Hours of work for residents are increasing again. This is Medical Council data in their 2019 report. Um, house surgeons up to 61.9. What the hell's going on there? We've just introduced Schedule 10. So this data is Schedule 10 data, and most house office rosters had been in at least 12 months by the time of that data. What's going on is that the residents are less fatigued, and so picking up, picking up more additional duties. We can progress there. Just saying. <laughs> okay, so SMO fatigue and burnout. The grim reality of the consequences for SMOs and their patients are suicide, patient harm, and death. And I've got the quote there from the, the latest coroner's report um, on the tragic suicide of an anaesthetist. According to my reckoning, we have had six SMOs commit suicide in the last two years. Just an absolute tragedy. And it is an indictment on our system that we're putting SMOs in the position where that is their only option. Now, yes, suicide is a complex um, uh, thing and there were other things in Dr Harding's life as there always are. But as the coroner said, um, the workplace contributed to their death. And I would, I would have actually have to say that evidence suggests that New Zealand has a somewhat fragmented response to dealing with factors that impact on doctors' wellbeing. That would be an understatement and something we're not going to have to get um, into, on top of. Um, I've been involved with a group of SMOs recently who um, there has been a patient death and the SMOs... Um, acknowledged that it was as a result of a mistake from a, an overtired, a fatigued SMO. Um, their answer was to increase the number of SMOs on the roster and have fatiguing weekends. This is one of these 80-hour weekends less frequently. 
That's not going to help. Every weekend, patients will still see fatigued doctors. It's just that the doctors themselves will be fatigued one in eight weekends instead of one in six weekends. We are going to have to face this. Um, and as a cohort who in 1985, and I'm a 1986 graduate, so I came in after that, but many of the people around the room here have enjoyed the 1985 change. Uh, brace yourselves, but I think it's coming back. So, but this time to the SMOs. I think it needs to. And we need to confront that. Oh, I didn't give you the slide, but I'm sure you've read the quote. Thank you, Charlie. Moving right along. Demographic. Almost 60% of our RMOs are female. In fact, we've been over 50% for over a decade here. This is Medical Council data. Please don't tell me there isn't discrimination on the basis of gender in our profession. And quite frankly, it is not good enough that women in medicine have to choose their profession on the basis of 2X chromosomes. And I'm not going any further. Otherwise, you won't stop me. However, um, button in the right direction, isn't it? There we go. The strengths. We have an Australasian medical training system, and it is a very good training system, so uh, let's just acknowledge that. Um, it's a true apprenticeship model. That is a huge strength of our system. I believe after 30 years of practice, that is um, without question. We uh, create a lot of work. We do a lot of work. We pr um, produce excellent practitioners, and it's, it's a portable qualification. We are amongst the best trained medical practitioners in the world. All good. However, um, for the Australian health system, it helps buffer their workforce needs. Uh, we are counted in their census as Australians. They do that for a reason. And it advantages our graduates. You'll be pleased to know that the resident doctors are always, already talking about the potential of Australian work in 2023, that being January 2023, the new um, dates. Um, and I'm sure you've heard about the Australian rates of pay. They are equally as advantageous for New Zealand residents as they are for New Zealand SMOs. Uh, this is a significant disadvantage for the New Zealand health system. One minute. One minute. <laughs> Keep me to I it. Know. <laughs> I do. Okay, so really whipping through them quickly. Guesstimate that we have 500 New Zealanders currently in Australian medical schools. We have 152 New Zealanders who have trained in Australia and come back to New Zealand. And we have most New Zealand trained doctors practicing outside of New Zealand are in Australia. And that's a 2018 uh, data. We have never had a net gain of Australians. And really quickly, this attitude that our workforce shortages are just recruited from overseas and that is acceptable is not acceptable. Our reliance on overseas trained doctors is unsustainable. We train them, but we don't retrain them. I won't go into any great detail here. We all know the figures, just over 60% leave in the first two years after they register and we get down to about 20% retaining. And interesting that the doctors from the UK and North America are more likely to be here temporarily. This is New Zealand uh, Medical Council Workforce Report. Just so you know, it affects trainees just as much as it train, uh, affects GPs and SMOs. Those are general surgical trainee figures. And taking it back to the RMOs, you can see I'm moving quickly now, 25% of the future SMO workforce, the RMOs, is made up of doctors who are here temporarily. These are the DHB's figures. So just 26% are UK grads. Quarter of our RMO population is here for two years. They get the same training as their New Zealanders. Medicine is a lifelong learning experience. Of course they should do, but that is wasted training experience in my view. Not wasted on the individual, of course, but wasted for the New Zealand health system. Why is it a problem? Well, it's obvious. We are at the beck and call of international crises, as COVID has told us, but Brexit was just as bad, and who knows what's coming next. It's a lost training resource. It introduces an inherent level of cultural incompetence. I find it amazing that we can, we can continue to ignore that issue. Um, and the cost advantages, well, there aren't any. They're expensive. Failures, in my view, the ongoing reliance, I've said that. The decision in 2019 not to lift the medical school numbers despite our shortfalls, ignoring the Australian labour market, whilst also enhancing opportunities to transfer to Australia, and a, a failure to capitalise on our most precious resource, the valuable opportunity to train and retain. 
which leaves us with what should we do about it. Second to last slide. Okay. Hold on, hold on. No, I'm just doing some work. Good, good. Right. I'm being kind to you. Good, thank you. Sisterly love here. We need to increase medical school placements, I believe, by at least 200. Uh, we will be calling for this tomorrow um, publicly, and we would um, enjoy the medical profession coming in behind us here. There is no way we can produce more New Zealand, New Zealand DCMOs, and I include GPs in that, if we don't train more of them. We have the capacity to train them because they would replace the 25% UK grads we've currently got there. We need to prioritise training for residents of New Zealand um, and support the profession to prioritise training. I know we are all busy. We are. But the the drain on, we have to just keep on plugging on with that service and training suffers. We have to fight against that because if we don't train these guys, how are we going to continue to deal with the increasing demand that we've got? We need to actively maximise the number of training positions. We did a bit of work um, within the orthopaedic um, area, and I'll, I'll leave Richard to talk further about that, but um, we, we believe we've got at least eight to ten training positions which we could create in New Zealand and comply with orthopaedic um, college requirements. Um, we need to actively maximise those. We need to acti actively address SMO burnout. We need to implement an evidence-based response to the risk of fatigue and workload. Be prepared to challenge traditional college views, including time-served versus competency-based programmes and esoteric examinations. And yes, the physicians, I'm looking at you again. Form a New Zealand College Branch Alliance to push for greater New Zealand autonomy and implementation of college standards and we have to adapt to the demands of demographic change. So my final proposition to you all, that for our pipeline to see, succeed, it needs us all to commit to every part of it. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for the nice segue into orthopaedics. Peter. Thank you. Just to the AV guys at the back, am I able to have presenter view up here, please? Is that possible? Yes. Mr. Oh, with the next slide. Mm. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Robertson. I'm an orthopaedic surgeon in Auckland. Um, I'm not an arthroplasty surgeon. I'm a spine surgeon. Uh, and Julian Fuller kindly invited me to come to the conference and uh, speak uh, well, a little different aspect from what we've heard at the moment about um, training and uh, work life uh, in orthopaedics relevant to the pipeline discussion. Uh, I don't believe you've had a lot of orthopaedic surgeons at the conference in the past. I'm the only one here that I can see from the uh, delegate list. Uh, Richard, the next speaker, is uh, an orthopaedic trainee. I've already been questioned as to why I'm here when I could be at home in private practice and earn a new car in the two days. <laughs> So I'm in the crosshairs, I guess, a wee bit. <laughs> um, we are at uh, perhaps one end of the spectrum of proceduralists um, in medicine. Uh, we are often characterised somewhat um, unkindly. <laughs> Stronger than an ox, but only half as intelligent. You see that in jokes. You actually see it in television programmes from around the world. The orthopaedic surgeons are always the sports jocks big white male, so I represent all of the risk factors. Uh, surgery in general is, has a uh, history of uh, bullying, um, and the College of Surgeons have been uh, very aggressive in trying to counter that. Uh, my information tells me that orthopaedic surgeons do not lead bullying and harassment figures in our own hospital, so that's reassuring. Uh, but the practical reality is that we, uh, in doing hip particularly and knee replacement, um, we're responsible for one of the great medical advances of the last century and in this room there will be a significant number of people who have had hip or knee replacement or spine surgery um, and for those of you who haven't, a lot of you will have it and you'll be very grateful for it. The figures tell us all that. <laughs> uh, the previous executive director of ASIMS uh, in his uh, goodbye article um, just uh, at the start of this year specifically selected us, and I don't know why, because we don't come. <laughs> All branches of medicine and dentistry have impressed me. There's a special place in my affections for orthopaedic surgeons because they hunt in packs and have no comprehension of ambiguity. <laughs> I've read that last bit several times and I'm still not sure it's a compliment. <laughs> 
So the practice model, model in New Zealand is that we are overwhelmingly part-time. Uh, the vast majority of members of the Orthopaedic Association are both in public and in private. There is a small number of people in full-time private early in their career and increasingly later in their career. Um, uh, but but full-time practice is, and in my view, should be relatively rare. And academic practice is gaining an increasing foothold uh, in the main centres. Um, these are the numbers. They come from North America. Uh, the the uh, graph on the left re represents the increase in knee replacement, hip replacement and spinal surgery as our population ages. Uh, this is one example of a paper that demonstrates that the people that are coming to us for care are incredibly disabled uh, and exceedingly grateful uh, for the results that the vast majority of them get. So I can tell you it's a wonderful profession to be part of. Uh, if we look at Health Workforce New Zealand, they've done a phenomenal job of, uh, of, of working out where we are, where we're going and the troubles ahead. If we look at the events, um, on the bottom line from 2018 progressing to through 2028, you see that there's going to be uh, about a 10% rise in events necessary based on population projections, but the complexity of those events is going to be greater than that at about a 15% increase. If we look at what our workforce offers, uh, on the left is two years ago, if you accept, and this takes no account of unmet need, if you accept that we might be providing an adequate service at the moment, and obviously that's a point for moot discussion, uh, by the time, that's at this end of the, of the graph, by the time we get another eight years out, ten years on from the start of this, the current workforce is going to have to work 15% harder based on the projections of increase in workforce to provide the same service to the population as it will exist there. Calculations from Health Workforce New Zealand suggest that we would need to train 22 new trainees per year starting two years ago and we're well below that. Orthopaedic training, generally two to three years as a house surgeon, two to three years as an unaccredited registrar, five years on the training program, the SET training program, one to two years of overseas uh, fellowship training has, uh, is the general pattern. So the fastest you can uh, come into practice is about a decade after you complete medical school uh, and more commonly it would be longer than that. Uh, a selection for advanced training in the country at the moment normally occurs after a minimum of two years as an unaccredited registrar doing orthopaedic runs. This year there were 50 applications for the, nation, the national training program. That led to 35 interviews and we selected 12 trainees to join the scheme. Last year 15 were, were selected and the reason there are not more selected at the moment is the limitation of positions we have. So I'm interested to hear Deborah's comment uh, on how that can be expanded. Uh, the exam is, uh, the, the, sorry, the training is very much an apprenticeship approach with an exit exam. Uh, we've been influenced by the changes in Australia. The Australian Orthopaedic Association has introduced a module based training scheme and that will uh, come into play over the next few years. Um, we are the poster boys for lack of diversity. Uh, and gender, uh, you know, 8% um, are our figures of the New Zealand orthopaedic surgeons are female. 14% uh, of our current trainees, we have two of the 10 examiners are female, one NZOA council member and no one has had the presidential or chairman of the education committee role. Uh, to balance that, the College of Surgeons has a diversity and inclusion plan with an aim of 40% female uh, females by 2021, and the barriers in orthopaedic surgery are probably key issues that we're all aware of. Work-life balance, difficulty of flexibility training, and this um, clear indication from outside that we very much have a boys' culture. I do not have a slide on Maori and Pacific Island um, training, but the figures are much as they were, have been indicated. So as Professor Baxter indicated, we have about, we believe about 4% of our surgeons are Maori. Um, our intake last year represented the population, 15%. Um, we are currently in the process of performing, of forming a Maori orthopaedic group, uh, Narata Koiwi, and they are looking at both mentorship 
uh, for Mar young Maori doctors to join orthopaedics, but also research, and particularly in the area of access for Maori and Pacific Islanders to uh, elective procedures on waiting lists through the public sector. We know that these patients are sicker and more disabled when they present. There doesn't seem to be a tremendous barrier to getting surgery once they get in, but it's getting to us uh, that seems to be the issue in the early, um, in the early uh, research. Um, Supply in the regions is an issue. The major centres are well serviced. The minor centres are not well serviced and it seems very hard to convince an orthopaedic trainee's wife to go to a smaller centre when they've spent uh, most of their training in the major centres. There are some advantaged smaller centres and some disadvantaged and I'm sure you can imagine which they are. The IMGs tend to fill the minor centres and there are the problems already alluded to with that. But to be fair, they provide outstanding service and contribution to New Zealand orthopaedics. And perhaps the undesirable part of this is that the surplus of trainees that do not get public hospital jobs tend to go into full-time private at a young age in some of the main centres. And certainly I don't see that as a desirable uh, career pathway. If I just speak ever so briefly for other surgical specialties, um, this uh, figure is in the pipeline document uh, from uh, ASMS. Um, the groups that are, have more surgeons over the age of 55 than they have trainees, I've highlighted, highlighted cardiothoracic and neurosurgery, it's exceptionally difficult for these people to train people for positions that might come up in the future because they're uh, so limited and you can't plan that far ahead, but they're also combined training programs with Australia. So these uh, registrars go to Australia, they like Australia, they get offered jobs, the money is a factor as has already been indicated. Um, so the last slide I've got is... All right, you've got 28 seconds. Okay, well the last slide I've got um, is an attempt to provide a solution. It's often said, don't come to me, management, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. Well I'm going to suggest a solution that you should all be very interested in. It involves money and it involves half a billion, half a billion dollars, um, which happens to be the amount that the deficits are in DHB each year um, and happens to be the calculated amount that accident compensation underfunds acute surgery in the public sector. So the ACC Act has the public, uh, uh, public hospital acute services section and all acute surgery uh, within the first seven days of presentation, major trauma uh, is funded by ACC through a number of indirect pathways that are exceptionally difficult to decipher and explain. The key thing is that there is no direct funding of trauma, yet the load of it has become greater and greater over the last two or three decades with the complexity of things that we can do. Um, it occurs by a bulk funding model that in no way delivers the true cost. Um, the Canterbury DHB have done some work on what they think their real costs are, and it's, it's rough work because costings in the public sector are poorly understood. Uh, but they estimate that they get reimbursed or paid through FAS approximately 50% of what they actually expend on acute services. And when you work that out across the country, it comes to half a billion dollars. Um, ASMs have been kind enough to publish uh, our work on, on this and we're representing this to the, uh, the Ministry of Health and ACC. The first response we got was, I don't think there's a will for change, but we're actually starting, <laughs> we are actually starting to make some inroads and uh, we see this as a solution or partial solution and contribution to the problem where we all go and say, we want more money. Well, we think more money can be arranged. The bottom right hand slide uh, just represents the over $40 billion that ACC has in reserves at the moment. I realise they need that for their tail and their foregoing claims. But it demonstrates the problem uh, with the system that we have in point and a potential solution. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to contribute. Thank you, Peter. More to think about. Richard, an actual RMO, future of the profession and all that. You get to go last. Thanks, Sarah. Morena, Namahinua Kiakwe Koto Kato e Hui Hui Mane. 
Many, many thanks for inviting me here to give you the insider's take on this important pipeline issue. Congratulations and thank you, Sarah, on completing an impressive detailed summary looking closely at our workforce. Your proposed solutions are good ones. We need committed and transparent leadership to enable successful workforce planning and retention. Tēnā koutou, my name is Richard Storey and I'm the Vice President of Stones, our Union for Junior Doctors. I'm also an orthopaedic trainee and an RMO and I'm going to tentatively lay claim to be amongst the youngest here, um, therefore the most heavily invested personally in the future. So following the flow dynamic metaphor for this issue, I'll present the DHB working environment as somewhat of a leaky bucket. So a zoomed in look at what our DHBs are doing in the pipeline. I'm going to sequentially cover off points which I think significantly contribute to poor working conditions for RMOs and precipitate both RMO and SMO burnout, dropout and failure of our pipeline. RMO burnout, as many of you all know, is between 40 and 70 per cent across different specialty groups and RMO levels. RMO burnout is quantified at greater than, than SMO burnout and found to be a peak in the non-training registrar group. This quick talk is designed to broaden your thinking about RMO and SMO dropout and try to find solutions in other areas you may not have yet considered. Before we start in the leaky bucket, let's look at the tap. Our medical schools. There is no doubt in my mind that our medical schools produce a high standard of graduate. Is the tap turned on enough? That's quite a hard question to answer. I'm not going to attempt to do that in this talk. Yes, the numbers have recently increased, but COVID has seriously impacted our RMO intake from overseas. Therefore, the question is still up in the air. It's important that in the next few years to understand that increasing intake into medical schools will not, will not solve the COVID-related RMO shortfall. Therefore, COVID RMO shortfall management must focus on the holes in the bucket rather than the tap. COVID aside, being in the system, I do, so, I do see the holes and the lack of retention as a huge issue and arguably bigger than the tap. I'll, ho I'll however make two clear points to take home about medical school in New Zealand. Our medical school training is right at the upper limit of six years for graduating non-vocational RMOs. And our RMOs come out of medical school with a significant debt. Why are student loans an issue? Well, we hear a lot of talk about housing crisis, subsidisation of training builders and other contractors, but very little bit about, about specialist shortages and what's being done in that realm. Why is this? Often because superficially, RMOs look like high earners. Looking closely, looking closely though, at the context of our remuneration, it's not surprising that RMOs feel somewhat hard done by, especially when you consider the hours that are going in. Student loan repayments, high tax rate, KiwiSaver, KiwiSaver payments lead to a modest to low take home pay after long hours. Yes, there are rewards towards the latter end of our pay scales, and these are our registrar pay scales, remember, uh, and once you land your SMO job and have paid off your student loan. That is, if you, whether the early days, are selected for vocational training, make it through vocational training, get through moving cities, keep your family together, and, and your health doesn't fail you in the meantime. The upper number scales of, these, of, of the salary scales here shown are a bit of a facade for unless something has gone wrong in your training, or your dual training, which is rare, um, most RMOs have qualified to SMOs by this time. So on day one of RMO life, whilst our PGY come, PGY1s come out with good knowledge and keenness, they're not exactly in the black financially. Rather, they have on a significant back foot with a mountain to climb to get ahead. Therefore, the water coming out of the tap isn't as pure as, one, as what we might hope. Now to the bucket. Work culture shock. PGY1 and PGY2 portray some of the worst working conditions that there are in the hospital. The transition from going from approximately 30 hours a week, give or take, at medical school to the 60 plus hour requirements for, um, of most of our junior RMOs is not to be underestimated. Many PGY1s are not well prepared for this, and for many it's their first proper job after being in medical school for the last six years. More work must be done to support this transition, focusing on the graduated increase in working hours, continued medical education, mentorship, pastoral care, and wellbeing monitoring. Also, notably, there's very little sec career, career security for these PGY1s who are starting on a journey, again, like I say, on a big financial back foot. My next point, forgive me, this is my broken record, and I raise it at every opportunity such as this. In this picture is a written document, a computer, and a tablet. 
Ask yourself, in patient care, does your DHB use a paper system, a computer system, or a portable device system, or do you duplicate and triplicate across two or three or even more? Five to ten years ago, most DHBs underwent, underwent somewhat of a pursuit of paperless workflow, which was not unreasonable, but most, for many reasons, fell short and now cling to both paper systems, poorly designed and poorly supported IT systems, and now are employing tertiary systems by way of applications, smartphones and tablets without the removal of old systems. It is most frequently the RMO's job to manually integrate across the systems with ever increasing expectations of safety and efficiency. Junior RMO's see, write, transcribe and sign off more and more information every year. Do not underestimate that as the admin burden goes up, RMO's exposure and development of essential skills for their vocation goes down. Therefore, their ability to thrive and progress on a vocational pathway is dramatically and progressively being eroded. This needs sorting out urgently. The pros and cons of either paper or tech-based systems need to be weighed up and commitments need to be made at both high levels of management and direct patient care environments. Entertaining dangerous duplication and triplication of legal patient information across multiple platforms is killing our patients and RMOs alike and must be addressed as a matter of urgency. Simply delegating this burden to our most junior, st junior staff is no longer acceptable. Thirdly, on top of all the other RMO challenges is that of administering world-class specialty training. This significantly challenges the business focus of DHBs and requires at least a decade or even lifelong financial and employment investment in individuals. Bonding and scholarship-like investment in these pathways have been degraded over time and are very difficult to justify in short-term business modelling and financial troubleshooting. Therefore, many losses are occurring at this level, and this is particularly seen in regional specialties, which relies on bonding and incentivising the workforce to, to a large extent. As we know, there's no one-size-fits-all, um, and one could easily write a different mecca for every specialty or even every DHB. And finally, two current buzzwords we use in your reports here, and thank you for including them. I just want to make a quick comment and caution advocates for each. Apprentice model training and flexible training models, in my opinion, are not yin and yang, but are polar opposites and need to be acknowledged for their ability to detract from one another when administered inappropriately. Both models are essential and supported by Stones, and both models are historic and ingrained within hospital-based training. But two key statements must be considered when discussing these terms further and the relationship between them. Firstly, flexible training risks erosion of the benefits of apprenticeship training relationships. And secondly, apprenticeship training has a limited ability to allow flexibility. There is a final hole in this bucket, but I don't see the final hole as a leak, more of a situation of burn off the top. With a negative lens, the DHB working environment can certainly be seen as somewhat of an acidic boiling pot where only the best prepared, lucky or resilient will survive and follow or stay in the pipeline. Hopefully this talk has given you insight into the current state of affairs within DHBs and for RMOs and gives you a broad perspective with many areas that could be addressed to help maintain a workforce pipeline in New Zealand. Once again, many thanks for having me at this conference. Thank you so much and thank you all for keeping to time. So we've got heaps of time for questions. Charlie says there's a big queue building and that you've been voting questions up. So I'm going to ask Charlie to put the questions and she will also direct whether the questions are for the whole panel or for particular panellists. If it's for the whole panel, I think to be fair maybe we could take turns at swinging like from the far end or closer to make sure that people get a fair, a fair go. So Charlie, you're away. Oh, you have to press the button. No, that button. One. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, I've given Anna a heads up that she's got a couple, so I might start with Anna. Um, top two questions at this stage, uh, largely to do with uh, whether or not the Ministry is planning on tracking unmet need, particularly in terms of assisting with workforce planning. 
Murray notes that doctor numbers have gone up by 1,700 over 10 years, but does the Ministry know how much health need has gone up during that time? And to balance needs, you need to know this, surely. Thank you, Murray. You've raised this one with me before as, as well. Um, so I think um, the first thing I want to say is, in, in flagging the 1700 number, um, I wasn't saying, uh, I wasn't doing that to sort of say, hey, you've had your growth, you can't have any more. Um, it was more to identify that there has been an increase in SMO numbers. And I absolutely accept that that will be um, predicated on a whole range of things, such as new services, population growth, and, and health need. Um, but it was more to, to sort of um, frame up a conversation that some of the other panelists have also raised about, about the other things that are needed to retain the current workforce that we, that we do have and to maximise the, the SMOs we do have through future of work, flexible working, um, different ways of training. So we'll probably have a question about that later. So to get to the Murray's question around um, unmet need and when the Ministry intends to sort of collect that. Um, that isn't one for me in um, health workforce, but I, I can take that back to the Ministry for you. But I am really aware of, of I think, the underlying concerns you have around workforce, workforce modelling. Um, the first thing that I do want to do, though, is acknowledge the work of Emmanuel Joe and my team. Um, a number of you here will have, the, my pan panellists will know Emmanuel, and I'm sure a number of you do. He uh, is amazing, and I describe what he does as a mix of algorithms, data, and witchcraft. Um, and he's internationally recognised as um, one of the leading um, modellers for, for health workforce projections going forward. Um, any model has its limitations, and, and at the moment, the way that we tend to model is very much based on current models of care, um, using current practices and building those assumptions in going forward. Um, and you know that includes things like current service delivery and, and current need, as, as you've said, Murray, which is what, we, what we're doing now, not what the unmet need is. Um, one of the things that we're, we're talking about in the directorate is how we can model on a more scenario-based um, basis that will include things like unmet need, but will also include changes to models of care, um, advancement in treatment, begin to look at the impact of interdisciplinary teams, changes to scopes of practice and that sort of thing, so we can um, uh, model different scenarios rather than kind of base our modelling on what we have now as the way it will be going forward. Um, and just one last point. Um, some of you may have heard me talk in the past about how a long-term aim, you know, a, a, an aim or an objective of mine is to make the data that we collect accessible to others so that they can start to do their own model modeling and, um, and use the information we, we have. We get a lot of information of our information from the responsible authorities. Um, we have just uh, entered, well, we're in the process of entering into an MOU with the DHBs, so we'll be able to directly access their workforce data. Um, we haven't been able to do that previously, um, so I think that that is a significant step forward in, in what we'll be able to do going forward. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to pose this question from Eileen Merriman, I think perhaps to Peter Crampton down the end. Uh, there is a whole generation of SMOs coming through who see clinical leadership roles as a poison chalice due to stress and burnout. Do you have any suggestions for how we should be encouraging and training SMOs for these roles, perhaps even back at the university level? Yeah, um, fantastic question. <clears throat> put the poison challenge, chalice of leadership. Well, that, I mean, <clears throat> the fact that their observation is made and the, the fact that there's a reality lying behind that is very distressing for our system. <clears throat> How does one go about changing that situation so that in five years... <clears throat> Clinical leadership roles will, would be seen as attractive. I think training pathways have a role to play in that. Uh, medical curricula have many 
partialities and gaps and holes. <clears throat> Leadership training is an area of relative weakness, generalizing. Training around leading for quality. Training around system science, systems intelligence. Training around uh, complex adaptive systems. All those are areas of relative weakness. The, the, the problem that educators have is that we can graft more stuff into programs, <clears throat> but, but they become too full, and we need to be taking stuff out as well. There's constant tension there. That all said, I think the problem is more to do with culture and leadership culture within clinical workplaces. These roles should be attractive. They should be an attractive adjunct to clinical work. They should be a, seen as a pathway to different sorts of interests. So I know I haven't answered the question with solutions, but I'm certainly acknowledging the problem. And I come back to a previous comment I made. Culture and leadership count for so much in the way we approach our work, whatever our workplace. And, and I would highlight that issue in response to that question. Deborah. Um, excellent question and um, one that the RDA has started to address. Um, we've put together a clinical um, governance training program. Um, so courtesy of the um, Education Trust, which for those of you who've been around a while is the leftover meals money, um, we did quite a bit of work and, and established an RMO clinical governance training program. Uh, we, we implemented uh, for house surgeons first and did some trials. They went extremely well and we have registrars uh, next on the um, pathway. Um, so starting with uh, reasonably basic um, quality improvement type processes, but then as registrars moving into the more nitty gritty um, so that by the time residents do turn into uh, SMOs, they have got training in clinical leadership. Uh, our problem is time. Uh, so we're working with the district health boards now and with the CMOs to prioritise this so that we get some time within our clinical lives to do these. Now, whether that's a, an afternoon a week for our relievers to try and improve um, the role of relievers or whether it's a run that people do or time in a run, uh, we've left that to the CMOs to try and carve out. But it is time. But there is an infrastructure there. If you'd like to have a look at it, it's on our website. And... Um, yeah, supported by the Quality and Safety Commission, of course. So it, it, it's sort of underway. Uh, it just needs that support from our DHBs to allow us the time to actually implement it. But we hear what you're saying. Um, yeah. Doing some work on it. Kia ora. Um, comments for our orthopaedic um, panellist. Uh, just two people have noted that the question as to why uh, why we should be blamed for why orthopaedic surgeons don't move to the rural areas is perhaps an indication as to the inherent gender bias in orthopaedics. Um, but the other question, perhaps more substantive, um, posed by Swiss from Canterbury, wouldn't the unmet need in orthopaedic workload be met by encouraging orthopods working their private sessions to perhaps shift more to the public? Um, so we'll... we'll the gender bias question and, and wives uh, is reality. I mean, if you've got 4% females as practicing surgeons, you've got 96% females. And so, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Thank you. Um, and, and that is a reflection on when you ask trainees where they want to go. and. Uh, where they want their families uh, to finish up. With regard to the um, provision of orthopaedic surgery in the public sector and the conflict, and this is quite often discussed and uh, has been brought up before about the private uh, surgeons not working in the public sector. So the rate limiting step is not access to surgeons. Let me make that absolutely clear. There are surgeons falling over themselves in the, in the hospital I work in to get cases done off the waiting list. The rate limiting step is infrastructure, 
it's access to theatre, it's anaesthesia, uh, and I, I don't mean that as any criticism, but it's getting anaesthetic services, uh, it's, it's towards the nurses and the like. There is, uh, in the institution I work at, there is absolutely no barrier at getting cases done. Guys are tearing their hair out with burnout because they can't do the cases that need to be done. Um, so I, I'd like to kind of make that very clear. Um, a question for Richard, perhaps from the Stones' perspective. Um, Siobhan, notes, Siobhan notes that uh, she 100% agrees with the Stones' point regarding the administrative burden, and it does make the job less interesting and leads to both burnout and probably the drain of RMOs out of New Zealand. Another recent question just come through on a similar point. Uh, the administrative burden faced by juniors, a small department uses the equivalent of one FTE signing off results that we've already seen, time that could be spent seeing patients instead. Do you want to comment on that, Richard? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a little bit of a, like a secret burden that kind of grows in the junior staff because the junior staff don't... That's their first job. It's their first year of working. They don't feel like they have any role in complaining or reflecting on what their job actually is. Um, so you have to sit down and ask them, uh, what's your day like? Oh, I, I spent seven hours on the computer today. Wow. Did you see any patients? Yeah, one. I listened to one chest today. <coughs> Gosh, OK. How do you feel about being a registrar next year and being on call overnight? I'm frightened. So we need to look closely and ask our junior staff what they're doing. Because if you don't ask them, they won't tell you. Yes, please. Um, I think, I think that's, there's a wider issue at work here. The reason you have to sign off so much in the, in the way of results is that you have um, a different force, and that's avoiding errors, avoiding complications, avoiding problems and therefore you have processes and processes lead to concerns regarding, uh, on the basis of concerns regarding safety, lead to paperwork and lead to checks and balances and the checks and balances um, unfortunately often end up at the bottom end of the pile. Um, but, but there's a wider picture there. Totally agree and I often sort of um, educate our junior staff on this because they'll often have the old adage from their senior staff saying, well, in my day I carried around you know, the paper x-rays and had to go and find them all. And uh, so, Well, you know, in your day, I think the pressures were different, the safety checks and balances were different and sort of the legal structure that the um, community expects and the accountability has changed a lot and we don't talk about that at all. Um, and how that changes and how that is resourced in our medical session. In, in our medical session. Yeah, if I can say, I, I think that um, there's system issues here. Uh, I think both the speakers, can I just say, I'm sitting between two orthopaedics and I haven't burst into flames yet. I mean, I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> or they haven't. Anyway, um, the last, um, uh, delegates meeting uh, sitting amongst residents and one of them said oh yeah we still fax the radiology forms through and most of the other residents were going what's a fax machine <laughs> um, and they tried to explain it was just there was just disbelief um, and you know talking to the registrars and the health centres about the future of medicine they get the technology and the frustration is but the technology can do this and we know how it can do it but but no one's listening to them um, you know, it, we, we recently had um, one of them just move in and reorganise um, the booking system for a particular department. They just went and did it. It was just so much easier than asking IT. They know this stuff. And yet we don't um, use that resource that we have, that this younger generation actually does know this stuff. They, um, why isn't AI here? They're not, oh, there's that thing out there. It's why isn't it here? And, and, and we need to embrace that because it is part of the solution. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions back to Anna. A uh, quick one from Tule. Is funding for dentistry uh, not included or is it included in allied health? 
Uh, yes, I do think we, do, I'm pretty sure we fund it, it just wasn't reflected up there um, as a separate line. Um, if you get in touch with me, um, I can give you the answer directly or you can go and have a look at the stock take which shows exactly what we fund and, and where it goes. But I'm pretty sure we, we uh, fund dentistry, but I can't give you the data, sorry. And one further quick question, hopefully from Wayne De Beer. Uh, Health Workforce New Zealand used to give data about postgraduate training to determine specialty needs. The last data dates back to 2014. When are we going to get this data to better inform training? So um, I'm not sure what specific data you're referring to. Um, if you can, I'm happy to have a chat with you afterwards if you'd like to have a, have a talk about that. Um, so is it specifically around what, where people are going? Oh, thanks. Yeah, you used to, I think, you had a chart that you produced about the current ages of SMOs mm -hmm. and the number of trainees. And we, we, in 2014, for example, you could see that paediatrics and, and that were over, and SMOs in ED, for example, mm -hmm. well-staffed, and you could work out where the specialty needs were. Yeah. In the past, you also used to fund, have uh, changes where, that we could, um, fund areas of needs, but we now have a static budget for yeah. the last five years that hasn't changed since you removed the GP funding, and now we, uh, it never changes, and so it, it's not yep. a flexible budget at all. Yeah, so I'll, um, I'll have a chat to Emmanuel about that um, and see what's happened and where that's gone and if we can start doing that again. Um, the other thing too, I think, is you're absolutely right in terms of our funding has been static and what we fund has been static. And I think when I was talking about one of our objectives around um, data and evidence-led workforce planning, that includes training and investment. So I, I think a big part is we, we need to address current vulnerability and for, for professions, um, but then it comes to the modelling and, and looking at our future population needs and growth um, and thinking what professions we need in the future, um, because it's been, has, it been, has, has been pointed out today, it takes a very, very long time um, to train an SMO, so we really need to do it, to start thinking about it now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pose the next question to all panellists, perhaps starting down with Peter at the end. And it's a question that uh, I think is a key aspect as to some of the issues around the higher propensity for women in the medical workforce to experience burnout. Um, and it's a question as to what is being done in a systematic fashion to allow or encourage more part-time SMO work, particularly for older SMOs to drop tents and call that younger SMOs can take up, and I would add to that, and also perhaps SMOs at different life stages, perhaps those grappling with the challenges of having younger children. So comments around that from the panellists, please. I won't comment on the substantive question because I think that is for others to comment on, but I will say that the, f <clears throat> the rolling three to five year average <clears throat> in medical school, I think at the University of Auckland and Otago, for male, female, is about 50% female, and that's relatively stable. And it, go, it flicks up now and again, and it's been up to close to 60% in Otago at one point. <clears throat> but the, the rolling average is around that 56, 57%. So we have an increasingly feminized workforce, which adds uh, huge relevance to the, to the question. Um, it, I think it's very difficult for uh, SMOs to reach a recipe that works within their departments to find a part-time role for themselves um, and that needs looking at departments and services need to work harder with their SMOs to make it work because when you when, uh, SMOs when they present this is my availability this is what I can offer to the community how can we make that work I think they find that path very very hard and too hard to um, to make a part-time commitment work and that should be easier. Um, add to that um, RMOs demanding part-time employment and um, yes we have uh, some issues. Uh, about 10% of RMOs um, we expect will uh, be working part-time as soon as we've finished our program to implement some part-time employment for resident doctors. I think this is part of a, a, a wider issue. I think we actually need to look at what we are asking to do, people to do at different stages of their career. Um, I'm a great fan of uh, acute care resting predominantly with senior registrars and junior SMOs. It's just a function of age as you get older. It's not quite as easy. And um, 
So there's, there's a number of things that happen in our life cycles that I think we need to roll into this, quite frankly, and we need to start looking at the profession. And it's, it's not just a female-male thing. The, the demand from RMO, male RMOs is just as loud as from female RMOs for part-time work, so it's part of their work-life balance issue. So um, we need to put this into the, the entire context of our work as doctors over the time of um, our life, uh, remembering that we have older residents. So some of our residents are older than some of our SMOs now. So I, I, the transition from um, registrar to um, consultant is an area I think we need to put more energy into and have some serious uh, discussions about, and I think this is part of that um, overarching. Apart from that, we, we've put it to the DHBs where um, <laughs> we're demanding part-time employment opportunities to be generated for RMOs. So watch this space because, uh, yeah, it's interesting. So interesting work. I'm not sure I know where to start, actually. Um, I don't think we can, as orthopaedic surgeons, we can comment on females in burnout, because, <laughs> and, and that's already been well alluded to. Um, the females that we do have in our profession, off the top of my head, I, I don't see burnout occurring. Um, but on inquiry, I have been surprised at the degree of, uh, of, of burnout um, when people have been polled in our profession, because I thought, orthopaedic surgeons were relatively resistant to it, and what I've alluded to, a very re rewarding profession. Um, in terms of um, part-time work, there's this conflict between experience versus expertise, and whether that's an important conflict or not. There are some people we know that you can teach them once, and they do it perfectly for the rest of their life, and there are other people you can teach them a million times and they never get it. Um, so they're not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily a, a conflict. Um, and part-time training should be a poss uh, possible, but as Richard has pointed out, there's a real um, conflict between apprenticeship and flexibility. Um, there's another issue to add into the, uh, the older uh, um, surgeons in particular, and particularly orthopaedic surgeons, it's, it's physical decay. And I can tell you that when you get to 60, your hands are not as comfortable as they were when they were 40. And I don't mean in terms of skills, I mean in terms of arthritis. Um, that's, a, that's a real factor. Um, so those are some comments. Can I, can I just say one thing? The, the, the training um, issue, and the, um, especially for the proceduralists, obviously, uh, we've done some research on competency versus time-based um, uh, processes, which I alluded to. There is no evidence that time-based systems produce competence. So um, I think we, we sort of rely as a, as a profession on time served, just, you know, we feel better about it. It's, always, it's the way we've always done it. Medical Council does it, they're still doing it. Absolutely no evidence, um, and with COVID and all the changes that have happened with um, residents over this year, you know, Medical Council has registered all first years, even though they have not done what first years normally do, and they are as competent as any of us were. So this whole issue of, of assessment of competence is something we need to grapple with, and as I say, time served, and you're quite right, some people do it once and they're good to go, and others, we're different, and we need yep. to accommodate that as well. So I think there's a bit of a challenge there. And, and the change to competency-based um, mm. uh, assessment is, is certainly uh, very much coming. Yes, I'm just looking for, yes, we've got competency assessment, now we can let go of the time served, but I just, <laughs> I just want to add, I think that this is a really, really important part of the pipeline conversation, because we can have as big a bucket and put as many people in um, up front at the start, but if we can't create uh, work environments where where people can bring them ho their whole selves to work, where, where they can... Um, have roles um, that suit themselves regard regardless of their age and stage at life, um, you're not going to get the most from your workforce and your, your, your pipeline's going to leak. Mm -hmm. So I do think there is a real challenge, um, particularly as we have younger generations coming through who have different expectations around work and what it means for them and what it looks like, how we adapt um, traditional careers, traditional training models and, and ways of doing things um, to accommodate everyone. It's, it's not about uh, changing things to, ju to just suit new grads or the young people coming through. It's actually about how do we retain the skills and experience we have with our older SMOs and our older professionals and actually create um, pathways and environments in which they can continue to contribute in ways that, that they want to. And I think... Um, 
we can we can get caught up on the we need more of X or we need more, and and I'm I'm not not disagreeing with that, but I do think a real critical part of this conversation is the work environment and how we create one where everyone thrives. Thank you. I'm conscious that we are getting close to the end of the session, so I might pose the last. Um, there's a couple of comments uh, around the notion of cultural incompetence and how the remedy for this is actually in better education, not finger pointing, and also the broader recognition that international medical graduates have long supported the New Zealand health system. Um, also the comment around training New Zealand graduates for New Zealand uh, might be representing an unwelcome pivot to nationalism because New Zealand has always benefited from doctors trained elsewhere. But the question specifically, and perhaps Deborah, you can start with this, is how could the NZRDA better support IMG RMOs to settle in New Zealand so that they will stay instead of seeing them as a waste of training resource? Um, my comments aren't directed at individuals or any sort of uh, negative comment towards IMGs. The fact of the matter is that um, we have a high turnover and according to our research into this, the main reason that residents, um, IMGs who leave the country in the numbers they do, is they move offshore for better terms and conditions of employment, predominantly to Australia, and predominantly for higher pay. Uh, that, um, you know, if you've got people who are mobile in the first instance, they're likely to be more mobile going forward. That's just a function of, of who we are as human beings. Um, so I'm not quite sure how we, um, well, it, that's going to continue to be a factor. Those individuals have those rights and we would support those rights um, to the hilt. But what does that mean for sustainability of the New Zealand market is what um, I was particularly interested in. Uh, in terms of assimilating our IMGs into uh, New Zealand, uh, RDA has a, um, a support program uh, for that as required through our delegates and reps. Um, and you know the RMO um, nature and um, behaviour and culture is to um, bring people in um, and uh, they're rid of family, especially in provincial New Zealand where we see large numbers of IMGs. Um, I actually, um, you know, from my perspective, I'm in charge of the budget for psychological support for uh, resident doctors, which is quite a um, considerable budget within the RDA. It is predominantly um, used for New Zealand graduates. Those are the people who come to us most. Now, whether that's because um, our international graduates um, don't want to, don't need, there's some cultural bias, I don't know, but um, yeah, most of that support is actually New Zealanders seeking it, so thank you. Uh, just quickly, there's a couple Hello. of questions which touch on the same theme. Sorry, Richard, to cut you off. Do you want to just quickly? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the, the um, loss of IMG RMOs back to the UK. Um, a lot of them moved back for family reasons and actually like being here. I'm sure a lot of you experienced that. But the other side of that is a lot of them were surgically minded, moved back because there's a pathway for them in the UK. They're actually held to do only 12 months or 18 months by the UK training system here. And then they have to move back for their interview to then go on to the core basic training. Um, New Zealand doesn't offer that at all to uh, IMG RMOs. They come and fall into a big pond a big pond with no future until they've done four or five years as a non-training registrar and then they're taken up onto vocational training. Um, so I think we need to, that is a very important point that there is no offered pathway and the other, other countries, particularly UK, Europe, offer much more strength and clarity around what is expected of them and what is there for them when they come home. Thank you. Uh, we're Almost out of time, I'm just going to sneak in one quick question for Peter. Why is it that medical schools are not increasing the intake? Can you repeat the question, please? It is, why are the medical schools not increasing their intake numbers? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> and, and Richard raised the point about medical student graduation numbers. Uh, so government controls funded domestic places for the, uh, New Zealand's two medical schools. Auckland and Otago. <clears throat> well, uh, Otago has 282 currently domestic students funded by government and it's capped at that. Uh, Auckland has slightly fewer, maybe it's 270, I don't know the exact, I've forgotten the exact number, but it's, in the, it's similar but a bit lower. <clears throat> uh, I would suggest <clears throat> that if we want to increase the numbers coming through the system, 
we should, as a system, be thinking very seriously about a third medical school. The lead-in time is going to be at least 15 years before we get a useful doctor out of a new medical school. And, and uh, this is a matter for public policy and policy consideration. I personally, personal view here, I would not look at shoehorning too many more medical students into what are two already quite large medical schools. <clears throat> I think New Zealand as a, as a country would benefit from a different sort of medical school somewhere. And that needs to be driven by a, a structured discussion and debate about what we want from a third medical school. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Sarah now. Yeah, uh, so that was frustratingly like scratching at the surface of a very long pipe or a very large garden or a very frightening swamp, depending on where you are. Look, it's one thing to accept an invitation to a conference or a meeting to present and maybe have a few questions at the end, but it's quite another to sit on a panel not knowing uh, where things are going to go and what questions you may have flung at you. And I just, I really want to warmly thank our panel participants for taking up that challenge and bringing so much richness and challenge to us for our conference and beyond. Nga mihi kia koutou.